Okay, looks like everyone's in. Um, so welcome everybody um, to this week's edition of Paleo Perks. Um, so this week we're really excited to have Joshua Zimt from the University of California, Berkeley um, in the United States. And Joshua's talk is entitled Exploring the Stratigraphic Expression of Extinction Events, a Case Study of the Late Ordovician Mass Extinction. Um, so the format of today's seminar, if you haven't been here before, it's been a while since uh. you joined us. Um, so we have a quick welcome and announcements for around five minutes, um, which I'm doing just now, followed by Joshua's talk um, and a moderated Q&A for um, around 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then um, our after talk tea time um, with this week's speaker, which we very much encourage you to stay for. Um, so don't forget to send your questions via the chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host, um, who today is Pedro. So a bit of housekeeping. Um, so Paleo Perks values the participation of all folks who are interested in the paleo sciences. Please remember to abide by our code of conduct during today's seminar. If you somehow found yourself here without having signed this, um, please take a moment to go to our website um, and familiarize yourself with this. And um, please remember to also mute yourself for the duration of the talk. You should find that you um, won't be able to unmute yourself, but if you find that you can, please remember not to so that we can maintain a nice quiet environment for our speaker. You can also ask questions by chatting to the questions at PaleoPerks host or by using the raise hand function. So if you do this, we'll call on you and you can ask your question by voice. Um, any technical issues should also go to the questions host. We have closed captions built into our Zoom. You can use the CC button at the bottom of your screen to show or hide them. If you hide them for you, it won't hide them for everyone else and um, they'll still be able to see them. Um, please also remember to nominate all of your outstanding early career friends um, and colleagues um, for the series. We're really excited to see um, all the nominations that come in. Um, and that link will be in the chat very shortly. Um, we also have our weekly feedback form for demographic information. Um, so this is anonymous, optional, but very much encouraged. And you'll also be able to find that in the chat window very shortly. Um, so now it's my great pleasure to introduce um, this week's speaker, um, Joshua Zim. So, um, Joshua did his um, bachelor's in geology at the Department of Geology at William and Mary College um, in the United States of America. Um, and he's currently a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley in the US, um, and also is the lead for the access program um, at the University of California Museum of Paleontology, which is a national community college outreach program. Um, and now I'll hand over to Joshua for his talk. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give a special thanks to my advisors, Seth Finnegan and Charles Marshall, who have been an unending source of in support and encouragement throughout the dissertation that I've been working on at Berkeley, as well as my committee member, Steve Holland, who was really the first person who got me thinking about sort of stratigraphic paleobiology and how the structure of the stratigraphic record can really influence our understanding of the history of life. And finally, Andre Desrochers, my collaborator at the University of Ottawa, the scientific director for the UNESCO Bid for World Heritage Status for Anticosti Island, who has been a fantastic resource in getting me set up on Anticosti for the field portion of my dissertation research, and has been a great mentor and friend throughout all of my work. So the, one of the main contributions of paleobiology to our understanding of both biology and the history of the Earth is the ability to link changes to the Earth's system to the history of life. And one of the main focuses of this area of research tends to be mass extinctions, where we have the raw numbers in terms of the numbers of taxa that are going extinct in a geologic, relatively short geological interval of time, and major perturbations to the Earth's system that allow us to really unequivocally link changes to the Earth to changes to the history of life and faunal turnover. But for those of us working when measured stratigraphic sections and looking at fossil occurrences, we're well aware of the fact that the stratigraphic record really is an important control on patterns of fossil occurrences in the fossil record. And this is something that's been known you know, for a very long time. It was first really brought to light with the senior lips effect. Um, but since then, there's been a lot of work done on how stratigraphic architecture can really affect our interpretation of patterns of faunal turnover in the fossil record, leading to the creation of the field of stratigraphic paleobiology, which is where the majority of my dissertation work takes place. And, and one of my favorite- we, we can't see your screen if you tried to take it over and it's it's glitched. Oh, yeah, it has glitched. Um, That's okay, don't worry. It's just the title slide. Let me, there's not much, too much exciting going on right there. 
Let me see. Let me try again with a new share. Is that better? Can everyone yeah. see it now? Yeah. That looks Perfect. Good. Yeah. So there's not much that's been missed so far. Thank you. Because now we're about to go to the next slide. So one of my favorite examples of this is not actually from the Ordovician, but it comes from the Caternary of the Po Plain in Italy. And this is a um, plot of molluscan fossil occurrences from Nero et al. 2018. So these are fossil occurrences of mollusks from a sediment core. So along the y-axis, we have meters below the top of the core here. And I want to know, again, this is late Caternary fossils. We have the systems tracks of a four sequence, uh, a four systems track framework, the low stand, the transgressive and high stand systems tract, a schematic stratigraphic column. And then we have our molluscan species organized by last occurrences along the x-axis. The blue line here is our maximum regressive surface and our green line here is our maximum flooding surface. Now, looking at this pattern of fossil occurrences, we see that we have a large cluster of last occurrences in the interval between 27 to 25 meters below the top of the core. And if we are interpreting this as paleobiological data, we'd very quickly interpret this as being a major pulse of extinction. If it wasn't for the fact that all of the species in this core are still extant and living in the Po Plain today. Now, obviously, if we had another sea level cycle and these lagoonal facies from the transgressive systems tract in which these taxa are found were to reoccur, we might expect to find those fossils again. But if this was the only part of the stratigraphic record we had, if this is the only portion we had, we would very quickly and erroneously make the interpretation of a mass, mass extinction occurring at around that horizon. And so this is a really great example of how the structure of the stratigraphic record and the presence and absence of facies, as well as the biological preferences of taxa, can influence our understanding of patterns of faunal turnover in the fossil record. Again, this has been known and published on for the last 20 years or so, particularly by Steve Holland and Mark Patskowski, who in their 2015 paper developed a modeling framework to explore the expression of mass extinction events within a sequence stratigraphic framework. And so what we have here is the output from one of their sim simulations on this plot here. So this is a stratigraphic column from their simulated sedimentary basin. We have stratigraphic position on the y-axis. Simulated uh, species last occurrences here in this bar graph on the first, or sorry, in the left-hand plot on the x-axis. And then water depth recorded in the core on the second, or I should say the right-hand plot where they've also labeled major stratigraphic surfaces and major systems tracks. Now, the first thing that you will note is that the distribution of last occurrence throughout this core is not uniform, even though there is no mass extinction occurring in this simulation. What you'll also notice is that the clustering of last occurrences is also not random. Clusters of last occurrences will predictably occur below in an association with major stratigraphic surfaces like the subaerial unconformity and transgressive surface, as well as at the maximum flooding surface where you have major offsets in water and condensed sections. So we know based off of these simulations and first principles that the distribution of last occurrences in a stratigraphic column will not be random, but it will be predictably structured based on stratigraphic architecture. And this is a great predictive tool when studying the fossil record, but one of the complications becomes what do you do when a mass extinction event might coincide with one of those major stratigraphic surfaces? So now what I've done here is I'm showing the initial plot that we just looked at on the previous slide with no mass extinction on the left-hand side of the page. And on the right-hand side of the page, I'm showing the same column again with a simulation where there is a mass extinction that is occurring at the time of the uh, sub conformity, in other words, during the low stand systems track. And if we look at the pattern of last occurrences we see here and compare them between the two columns, they're virtually indistinguishable. So with the principles of stratigraphic paleobiology, we would expect to see clustering of last occurrences at this major sequence boundary, but it's not entirely clear whether or not that, based off of a face value reading of the fossil record, is actually due to a major extinction event or due to stratigraphic control on fossil occurrences. And so this was really the question that spurred my dissertation research, which is how can we use stratigraphic architecture, sequence stratigraphy, as a tool to deconvolve the stratigraphic and biological signals of the fossil record to be able to interpret the underlying pattern and drivers of the mass extinction, in particular when they coincide with major fluctuations in sea level, which many of Sapkowski's big five mass extinctions do. 
So what we have on the screen here is Sapkowski's family level compendia of throughout the Phanerozoic. So we have the number of families of marine taxa on the y-axis here. And on the x-axis, we have geologic time millions of years. And of course, this famous diversity curve marks the big five mass extinctions, the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, the end Triassic mass extinction, the end Permian, the late Devonian, and the late Ordovician mass extinction that occurred at the Ordovician Silurian boundary, which is really the case study that I selected for the focus of my dissertation research, as the clusters of last occurrences associated with the late Ordovician mass extinction are closely tied to major stratigraphic surfaces. And this is nicely shown in this figure that I've adapted from Harper et al. 2014. So what we're looking at here is a global view of the late Ordovician during which the late Ordovician mass extinction took place. In the left-hand plot here, I have the updated 2020 geological timescale with the stages at the end of the Ordovician, the Cadian and Hernantian stages, and the earliest Silurian Rudanian stages. I want you to note really quickly that the Hernantian stage is very short, lasting only about 2 million years. So all of this, all the entire mass extinction is really constrained to a period of about 2 million years in the traditional interpretation of the late Ordovician mass extinction. In the upper Ordovician stratigraphic record, we commonly find two clusters of last occurrences, which are often interpreted as two pulses of climate-driven extinction. The first and larger cluster of last occurrences that you can see in these spindle diagrams here occurs just before the cadian hernanchian boundary, where we shift globally from a world dominated by greenhouse conditions more or less, but with small ice sheets over the South Pole, to the rapid cooling and growth of ice sheets, which is accompanied by a major glaciostatic sea level drawdown that is indicated in Hernanchian sections oftentimes by a major facies offset, a surface of forced progression. And then a second smaller cluster of last occurrences is found in the mid to late Hernanchian, and this is often associated with the deglacial sea level rise, global warming, and the collapse of ice sheets. In other words, this cluster of last occurrences is associated with a major transgressive surface. And so oftentimes, these clusters of last occurrences are interpreted at face value as two uh, climate-driven pulses of extinction associated with global cooling and global warming, respectively. However, their association with major stratigraphic surfaces immediately raises questions as to whether or not these cluster of last occurrences are actually representing the underlying pattern of extinction or if rather they are an effect of stratigraphic architecture controlling patterns of last occurrences in the fossil record. And this would not be unexpected given the world that has existed or the given the window that we have into the world during the late Ordovician, right? So here is one of Robert Blakely's maps from the late Ordovician. This is a paleogeographic reconstruction where we have, for example, Lorenzo here sitting just south of the equator. And much of the upper Ordovician fossil record is dominated by epicontinental seaways, which during the order, which during the Hernanchian stage, where we have major glaciostatic sea level fluctuations, we would expect to be continuously drained and flooded as sea levels fluctuated globally. And this would generate a very complicated stratigraphic architecture, which would certainly affect the preservation of biological signals in the fossil record. And so this was the driving question behind my dissertation. And so what we're gonna go through here are sort of the two main parts of my dissertation work. The first part is focused on forward modeling of the upper order of vision stratigraphic and fossil records to explore the impact that stratigraphic architecture has on the expression of late order vision extinction events. And then with the methods I develop in the first part of my dissertation, I'll then give you some updates in part two about my ongoing field program at Anticasi Island, where we're working to apply the methods former forward modeling to the record of the Ordovician Slurian boundary on Anticosti to reinterpret the underlying pattern and drivers of the late Ordovician mass extinction. So in this first part here, what I'll be working through is the um, forward modeling framework that we use sort of to develop best methods for studying mass extinction in the fossil record. To begin with, we started out by generating a stratigraphic record using the basin filling model SETFLUX 2.1 published by Hutton Savisky 2008. SETFLUX 2.1 is a base Silus clastic basin filling model with a point source of sediment in one part of the basin that then distributes sediment across the entirety of your hypothetical depositional basin. It runs using a user input sea level history, which you can see in the input plot here, where we have sea level elevation on the y-axis in meters, and then time from the start of the beginning of the simulation in millions of years. We have a simulated Hernanchian stage, which I've shaded in light blue here, which has two successively larger sea level drawdowns, 
which is a common pattern seen in Hernandian stratigraphic records along, around the world, or I should say interpreted from Hernandian stratigraphic records. We then let the model run for the entirety of the 4.2 million year simulation to generate the base and cross section that you see on the screen here, where a sediment wedge is color coded by the different grain sizes from sand to clay based off of the colors from yellow to blue. From this cross section, we then extracted five stratigraphic columns, the most proximal columns being rate, uh, columns E and D in the distal parts of the basin, more proximal columns A and B, and obviously up dip settings. Each of these columns records a water depth history that we then use to generate a sequence stratigraphic framework for the basin. So what we're looking at here is the output from water uh, from column D. In the far right hand plot, we have stratigraphic position on the Y axis. Uh, excuse me for a second, there's an alarm going off. We then took this water depth curve, and I want to note, for example, that our Hernanchian stage is once again labeled in blue here. So we have our water depth curve from column D. We then bin water depth in each of our stratigraphic columns into a series of relatively broad facies, which are shown in this graphic column here, with darker blues representing deeper facies and lighter blues representing shallower facies. We then, in each column, use the stacking of these faces to delineate systems tracks within each of our two major glaciostatic or interpreted glaciostatic fluctuations in our Hernanchian part of the simulation. And so, for example, TSD2 here is the transgressive systems tract of the second sea level drawdown. We also included uh, buffer intervals of 400,000 years after the simulation and before the simulation, post and pre, respectively, to account for edge effects in the simulation. So using this method, we generated a sequence stratigraphic framework for our basin, and we use this to simulate a variety of mass extinction scenarios. Each simulation of a mass extinction began with 200 taxa, where each taxon has its own unique fixed water depth preferences based off of the Gaussian distribution. We then used a random branching model of extinction and origination to populate basically a species pool for the entirety of each simulation where the background extinction rate is set to 0.25 species per lineage per million years. After running several simulations in which there was no mass extinction to get a baseline of last patterns of last occurrences in each stratigraphic column, we then simulated a variety of Hernanchian extinction scenarios that were normalized to 80% extinction for the entirety of the Hernanchian stage. And this includes a variety of plausible single pulse, double pulse, and gradual extinction scenarios. Now, when we're looking at patterns of last occurrences from these stratigraphic columns, we're primarily interested in understanding where we see basin-wide last occurrences of different taxa, as it's been previously proposed that putting fossil occurrence data into a sequence stratigraphic framework would be able to account for stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences associated with, or that could mask the underlying pattern of a mass extinction event. So again, here we are in column D, we have stratigraphic position on the y-axis, taxa ordered by last occurrence on the x-axis, the open circles indicate a occurrence in the column, and the shaded circles indicate where a last occurrence in column D is the base and Y last occurrence for a given taxon. Now, the interval extinction in this column is located up here at around 11 to 13 meters. And we see that we have a large number of last occurrences for this column, but much lower down in the column, we have two base and Y clusters of last occurrences. In other words, these are where in this column, Prior to the interval extinction, this is the last time we see these taxa. So the question becomes, what happens when we course in our data to the systems tract level and place all of the data for a given mass extinction scenario within a basin-wide sequence stratigraphic framework? And so this is the output from one of these plots. Before we walk through it, what I want to say is the takeaway from this plot is that what we find are that even at the systems tract level, we find that stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences persist in basin-wide reconstructions of a mass extinction. So what we have here on the y-axis are our system tracks from pre to the first um, major sea level cycle and then the second major sea level cycle. We have patterns of last occurrences and fossil occurrences at the systems track level from compiled throughout our basin in the left-hand panel. And in the right-hand panel, we have our sea level curve for the Hernanchian stage with the interval of mass extinction and TSD2 marked in red. And what we find are that, predictably, we have a large number of last occurrences in this systems tract. However, we have a backscattering of last occurrences to previous systems tracts. 
So back in the left-hand plot, each taxon is represented by a series of bars that indicate whether that taxon was present in a given systems tract indicated by blue bars or absent in a systems tract indicated by light gray bars. And we differentiate in systems tracts where a taxon is absent and its preferred facies is present, a light gray bar, versus dark gray bars, which indicate where a taxon's preferred facies is absent and the taxon itself is also absent from the fossil record. We've also included black dots in each systems tract where a taxon goes extinct. And again, what we see is that in the second transgressive systems tract, we have a large number of last occurrences that coincide with the extinction of each taxon during the mass extinction in the second transgressive systems tract. However, we have clusters of last occurrences that also are found in the following, second falling stage, first high stand, and even pre hernanchian stage in the simulations. In other words, what we're finding is that a basin-wide sequence stratigraphic frame or a basin-wide sequence stratigraphic um, framework that can be used to contextualize patterns of fossil occurrences isn't sufficient for removing stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences. And we have to ask ourselves why. If we return to our pattern of last occurrences of column D and add in the schematic diagram that shows patterns of facies and systems tracks on the right-hand part of the plot here, we can begin to understand why. So again, here in the left-hand plot, we have our pa uh, pattern of last occurrences in column D with stratigraphic position on the y-axis, and we have our two basin-wide clusters of last occurrences marked by these red lines here. And what we find are that these basin-wide clusters of last occurrences occur at major facies shifts and major sequence stratigraphic surfaces. What's happening is that taxa that are found in these basin-wide cluster of last occurrences have a preference for particular facies that are then not found in any other part of our recorded basin prior to the extinction in the second transgressive systems tract. Therefore, their last occurrences will fall in the systems tract where the last time their preferred facies is present. In other words, we're going to have a back smearing of last occurrences because of the structure of the stratigraphic record as well as each taxon's facies preference. And so we propose that because basin-wide analyses do not remove stratigraphically generated cluster of last occurrences, and that these last occurrences persist due to the loss of facies from a basin-wide record, we can filter out what we consider these ambiguous last occurrences, ambiguous because the last occurrence of the taxon occurs with its last occurrence of its preferred facies from the basin prior to the mass extinction, to reinterpret the mass extinction and determine the underlying pattern of the extinction event. And so we propose that if a taxon's basin-wide last occurrence occurs in a major stratigraphic surface and its last occurrence corresponds with the loss of its preferred facies at the systems track level, then we remove our taxon from the analysis of the extinction because its last occurrence is ambiguous with respect to the underlying pattern of the extinction. And if we apply this method, say, to our second transgressive systems track extinction scenario, so here again is the initial unfiltered data set, if we apply our ambiguous LAD filtering method to this data set, what we recover is a single pulse of last occurrences coinciding with the time of extinction in the second transgressive systems track and the earlier stratigraphically generated clusters of last occurrences have been removed or reduced, allowing us to recover the underlying pattern of extinction. Now, I don't have time today, but what I will note is that we've run this um, method on a variety of single pulse, double pulse, and gradual extinction scenarios, and each of them has been able to accurately uh, determine the underlying pattern of extinction, particularly compared to analyses from either individual stratigraphic columns or simply base and wide reconstructions of the mass extinction in a sequence stratigraphic framework. So this ambiguous LAD filtering method is able to remove or reduce stratigraphically generated last occurrences in our basin-wide analyses at the systems track level. And the simulations provides a consistent and accurate way to identify the underlying extinction scenario. However, the question becomes, how can we apply this understanding to study the late order division mass extinction? And this is really the bulk of my, the main focus of the bulk of my dissertation research, applying the ambiguous LAD filtering method to reassess the late order division mass extinction on Anticosti Island in Canada. Now, Anticosti Island is located in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in eastern Quebec, so on the all the way on the opposite side of the country, or sorry, on the continent. So it's only a short 26-hour uh, trip to get there from California. And Anticosti Island is unique because it records one of the thickest and best preserved regional Ordovician slurry boundary sections in the world. The island records mixed carbonate siliciclastic deposition in a tropical forming basin across the Ordovician Silurian boundary. 
And with strata opposed, exposed across the island, it makes an excellent place to study the dynamics of the late Ordovician mass extinction. In particular, the Ellis Bay formation, which I have shaded in green here in this stratigraphic column for Anticosti Island, as well as the outcrop uh, exposure of the Ellis Bay formation across the island here, is one of the thickest Hernanchian sections we have in the world, reaching almost 90 meters on the western end of the island. The Ellis Bay formation is also unique in that it, it records a range of detrimental environments from offshore or deep water, I should say, carbonates and shales in the western part of the island to shallow water mixed carbonate siliciclastic phase seas ranging from tidal flat to foreshore and off to deep cell tidal environments in the eastern part of the island. However, one of the difficulties with Anticosti Island has been generating a correlation framework across the entirety of the island. Early lithostratigraphic frameworks really were not able to correlate localities on the western end of the island, like Anso Fraise, Cap Hongri, and Point Lafayette with localities on the eastern end of the island that were fundamentally different in terms of the processes and sedimentation that is happening in that area in the more proximal settings. And even in the eastern part of the island, there were different lithostratigraphic frameworks to compare, say, sections at Riviera Simon to Anse Mauvaise. So there's this real issue with stratigraphic correlation in the Ellis Bay Formation that would prohibit the application of Zimt et al. to studying patterns of faunal turnover within the Ellis Bay Formation. Now, the landmark study of De Roche et al. 2010 proposed a sequence stratigraphic correlation framework across the entire outcrop belt from Anse Mauvaise at the eastern part of the island to Anse en Fraise and Point Lafrenbois at the western part of the island a gap of 200 kilometers, but they proposed that they could identify five transgressive regressive cycles within the Ellis Bay formation. However, early on in the field part of the project, what we realized is that these cycles cannot be correlated to other outcrops along the eastern part of the island. So again, De Roche et al. 2010 was correlating en Mauvais on the western eastern part of the island with en saint Fraise and cap Henri and Point Lafrenbois on the western end of the island. And this, the framework is not correlatable or is not extendable to localities between also Mauvais and also Fraise. And so the focus of my dissertation became generating a sequence stratigraphic framework that would allow us to correlate among both these eastern sections as well as correlating the eastern sections to the western sections to generate a basin-wide framework that in which we could place fossil occurrences across the Ordovician slurring boundary. So what I want to do now is just walk through some of the field sites I've been working at, as well as some of the complication discoveries we've made within the Ellis Bay Formation. So to begin with, we're going to start at Anse Mauvaise, which is the easternmost locality here, where we have beautiful exposures of coastal cliffs that give us unparalleled access to the fossil record. And here my collaborators, Drs. Andre De Roche and Seth Vinnegan, as well as my friend Ryan Caspery here, are looking at this contact between this upper shore face sort of reddish calcarinite mixing with sandstone and this white nodular shallow subtidal uh, facies. And if we look at this contact up close, what we see is that it, the shallow subtidal facies are amalgamated directly onto the upper shore face. And we have large decimeter sized chunks of the underlying shore face ripped up into the shallow subtidal layer. We also see these coarse siliciclastic pebble lags, which we'll talk about throughout the Ellis Bay Formation as part of the talk, as well as micro karst immediately below the surface and meteoric cements cementing the underlying upper shore face sandstones. What we realize is that this is a major subaerial exposure surface, a sequence boundary, based off the data we have here. This was initially recognized in De Roche et al. 2010, but what we realize is that this surface is actually traceable across the eastern end of the island. It's not just restricted to the upper part, uh, upper part of the ramp in shallow water settings and all small vays, but as we get to progressively more distal localities, the surface is still traceable. And this is one of the common themes that we're talking about here, which is that previous studies had interpreted that eastern parts of the Ellis Bay Formation were relatively conformable. However, we're finding evidence of very subtle sub airline conformities that bracket uh, sequences within the eastern Ellis Bay Formation. If we then go to the next most up dip locality, just to the west of Anse Mauvais at Bay Prince, again, we have beautiful exposures of the Ellis Bay Formation. We actually have up here, really high in the cliff, that same contact between uh, the upper shore face sandstones and the shallow subtidal nodular beds. But lower down in the section, we have a very interesting ball and pillow structure, which you can see sort of halfway across the image here, 
with one metric Josh for scale standing at five foot, 10 inches. And this ball and pillow structure is traceable all the way from Rousseau Macaire to Anse Mauvais, just upped it from Bay Princeton. And interestingly, what we note is that the ball, the axes of these balls and pillow structures are irregularly eroded and filled in by these large, heavily pyrotized and bored ripoplasts. They're also found with significant quartz pebble lags, which is interesting to note because the deep subtidal facies both below and above the ball and pillow structure completely lack any coarse lithoplastic grain sizes. They're all fine grain calci silt types to micrites. And so what we interpret these lithoplastic pebble lags as indicating is a fallen base level, which brought out coarse lithoplastic material via river systems onto these mid ramp settings that was then subsequently reworked into transgressive lag during the ensuing um, base level rise. And these transgressive lags with quartz pebbles and quartz sands are traceable again across the entirety of the Eastern Ellis Bay Formation, suggesting that this was a regional event correlating with a rise in sea level. And finally, if we go all the way to our westernmost locality at Riviera Nutisotec, where we have beautiful exposures still of the Ellis Bay Formation. For example, here, my field assistant Stephanie Yang is standing on a well-developed pyritic hard ground with meter-sized planed off cephalopods. It's over this hard ground is then overlain by offshore shales and then abruptly overlain by shallow subtidal nodular grain and pack stones. But this hard ground is actually far more complex than a simple maximum flooding surface. Because if we look at thick sections and thin sections of the underlying sediments, we find once again that we have this coarse quartz and lithic, fra uh, lithic fragment lag that is contained right below the hard ground. And again, the underlying deep subtidal facies is entirely devoid of these coarse grain sizes, suggesting again that we have a base level fall that is bringing this material out onto the shelf. In association with the surface at Riviera Natiska Tech, the base of this transgressive lag is marked by a highly, uh, a sharply defined surface with diagenetic halos, as well as a negative carbon isotope excursion, all of which indicate that there was an interval of subaerial exposure prior to this transgressive lag being deposited and then quickly overstepped by that maximum flooding surface hard ground. So with these, uh, with these subaerial conformities that we've been able to trace across the Eastern Ellis Bay Formation, we're for the first time able to propose a correlation framework for the Eastern Ellis Bay Formation that can correlate among localities. And this is the first framework that's able to do so in the last hundred years of study working on the island. So here what we have are seven localities from the Eastern Ellis Bay Formation with facies indicated by the coloration and width of the boxes here. And what I'd like to draw your attention to in particular are these red lines that indicate sequence boundaries. We've been able to trace one, two, three, four sequence boundaries throughout the Ellis Bay, or I should say, yeah, four sequence boundaries. I can never remember the number off the top of my head within the Ellis Bay Formation, defining six sequences that we can trace again from the up to localities at Anse Mauvais to Riviera and Tech down dip. Even in some cases, finding evidence of incised valleys that are commonly found in other Hernanson sections worldwide. Now, these section, these correlations are not only backed up by sedimentological and stratigraphic data, but we have also been able to produce a large amount of high resolution chemostratigraphic data for the Eastern Ellis Bay Formation. So now what we have are our stratigraphic columns and to the left of each of them, we have carbon isotope curves for each of our localities with stratigraphic position on the Y axis and carbon isotope values on the X axis. And for example, this maximum regressive surface that marks the base of the Ballin sequence is associated with a small positive carbon isotope excursion of two to three per mil, which is traceable across the surface at Anse Mauvais, Riviere Schmidt, Rousseau Macaire, Rousseau à la Batterie, Riviere au Simon. And again, we have another positive carbon isotope excursion carmed the upper heist by Mobile and Derrichet 2016 that is traceable across the entirety of the Simon sequence. And this is traditionally interpreted to be the peak values of the Hernanchian carbon isotope excursion, which is seen globally in this time interval. So with this combined sequence stratigraphic, sedimentological, and chemostratigraphic framework, we've been able to develop a robust framework for correlation within the Eastern Ellis Bay Formation that will allow us to apply the findings of Zimtadol to the fossil record on Anticosti Island. Moving forward, our goals are to extend this framework to the Western exposures of the Ordovician Slurian boundary section, which will be the upcoming summer field season on Anticosti Island, 
So we begin incorporating fossil occurrence data from the Western and Eastern exposure to the Ellis Bay formation, as well as geochemical proxy data, including a new data set of clumped isotope and oxygen isotope data that I've been in, um, creating with Kristen Bergman, Adam Johnson, MIT, and Ted present at Caltech that will enable us to interpret patterns of climate change within the Hernanshan at unprecedented resolutions. And so the goal with this final project is to be able to generate a regional reassessment of the late Ordovician mass extinction that combines stratigraphic, paleobiological, and chemostratigraphic data into a comprehensive understanding of the pattern, timing, tempos, and therefore drivers of the late Ordovician mass extinction on Anticosti Island. Moving forward, the other goal of this project is also to provide a um, methodology that future studies can use to begin to apply the uh, findings of Zimtadol 2021 to the fossil record, to apply the principles of stratigraphic paleobiology to the fossil record, to generate new understandings of mass extinction and final turnover throughout the history of life. And with that, I'd like to thank the following funding sources, as well as special thanks to the community of Port Menier, who have been wonderfully supportive throughout all of my uh, adventures on Anticotsi Island, um, my field assistants, Ryan Caspery, and collaborator, Pedro Monarez, as well as the Finnegan and Marshall Labs. And with that, I'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd be happy to take any questions. And I'll go back to here. Great, thank you so much for such an awesome talk. Um, so a quick reminder to the audience, um, you can send your questions in to the questions at PaleoPerks host, um, or paste them in the chat, or, or raise your hand um, and we'll call on you. Um, so we have one question um, in already, which I'll, I'll paste for you in the chat. Um, Uh, is from K. Sender Sawan. Um, so, can the Lilliput effect be considered as a reliable measure on the presence of a mass extinction event for most small planktonic taxa? And can this inference be applied to other taxa higher up in the food chain? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, are you, I believe in this case, you're referring to Chitinozoa or are you referring to taxa that have a planktonic larval stage? I believe it's it's the latter but I just want to make certain I'm understanding the question correctly. Okay. So we, we don't have any more. Uh, okay. On the so what's interesting about the record Anticosti Island is that at least across the lower boundary of the Hernandez stage, we don't see a remarkable little put effect, though I know um, colleagues, Selena Cole and uh, Davey Wright, at the Sam Noble Museum are studying the little put effect on Anticosti Island and sort of for her, uh, late Ordovician sections worldwide. Um, it's tricky to be able to understand a little put effect in these sort of circumstances where we have major facies offsets, unless we have tax that are sort of comparable prior to and after the extinction event. So for example, in the or across the Ellis Bay Bexi boundary, which in our reinterpretation of sort of the Hernanshan stage in Anticosti Island represents the continuation of the Hernanshan stage, but the second or a pulse of extinction during the Hernanshan, we do see decrease in body size of uh, Vinland dystrophia, a orthid brachiopod. However, writ large body sizes don't necessarily decrease across that contact. And so the question of whether there is a little put effect happening in Anticosti Island is an ongoing area of question, thus Lena Cole's research. Um, whether or not this can be applied to further up the food chain is an interesting question. I do know we see, for example, a change in the phytoplankton close to the top of the Owls Bay Formation, um, but whether or not this necessarily means that there's a mass extinction happening at higher trophic levels, I think is an interesting question that requires further research. That's a great question though, thank you. Nice. Um, do we have um, another another question? Um, ah, okay, one that's just posted in the chat, actually. Um, if you have to exclude taxa from your analysis due to fascist dependency, do you run the risk of reducing your data set to the point that it is not statistically relevant? 
Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I love this question, actually. Um, it, it's an interesting question because, because of facies dependency, we have to be really overcautious when we have major facies offsets of how we interpret patterns of last occurrences, right? I mean, the way I'm gonna perhaps give people whiplash by scrolling back through slides, but so let me pause my screen. Um, but the general idea that, or the way I approach this question is, if we have something that lives in a sh deep water offshore environment, and then our record for the entire Hernanchian stage are these shallow water inner ramp deposits, are we that surprised that we don't recover that taxa during the Hernanchian stage? And I would argue, no, we wouldn't expect to find those offshore tax living in shallow water deposits. But the next time you see those offshore deposits, obviously those taxa are absent. And so the question becomes, well, where do we place the timing of that extinction? And I would argue that because we don't have the proper facies, that last occurrence below or that the contact of that shale to sort of inner ramp settings is really not informative with respect to the underlying pattern of extinction. So what happens if you have so many taxa that sort of exhibit this facies dependency that you're unable to get a statistically relevant data set? I would argue that then the questions that we ask about the mass extinction have to be tailored to the ability to reliably interpret patterns from the fossil record. So if I had a large number of taxa that went extinct at that surface and I was no longer able to have a statistically relevant number of taxa, I wouldn't be so much focused on the underlying pattern of extinction, but perhaps looking at patterns that we see in the taxa that we can reliably understand. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping to gain from Anticosti is insight into whether or not the record Anticosti can actually be used to study the mass extinction event. Um, because of the fact that I feel strongly that we have to really be tailoring the research questions we're asking to the limitations of the data sets that we're exploring. And I think this question gets at the heart of that. So that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we have another question in um, from Bethany Allen. Um, so thanks for the great talk. How much of the observed signal lips effects do you think are attributable to the stratigraphic phenomena you describe? And do you think that there are particular other mechanisms that cause the rest? Yeah, so the signal lips effect is really funny in this case. I've talked with Charles, uh, Charles Marshall about this, who was you know, pioneer confidence intervals. And it's interesting because, right, the singular ellipse effect tends to occur where you have relatively monotonous facies, like in the Zamaya sections where Carl's looking at the Cretaceous ammonites. Um, and I feel like in a lot of the Hernanchian sections, we're not so much dealing with the signal ellipse effect, but we're really dealing with this, this issue of facies dependency and stratigraphic architecture and the limitations of the stratigraphic record to find the facies that we need to recover certain kinds of taxa. Um, so in Hernanchian sections in particular, I would argue that a lot of the effects that we're seeing, the stratigraphic phenomena are due to this biological sort of tendency to live at a certain water depth that's represented by facies in the fossil uh, stratigraphic and fossil records. And the presence and absence of those facies will control where we expect to find taxa. And therefore, when we have major glacial static sea level fluctuations like we see during the Hernanchian with major facies offsets, we're going to be running into this issue of the structure of the stratigraphic record really influencing the under the interpretation of the pattern of extinction. And this can also lead to additional issues, excuse me, complications of clustering of last occurrences at major stratigraphic surfaces and subway line conformities that might actually contain the time of extinction or might represent the time of extinction. But in fact, we're not getting any information because of the unconformity as to what is happening during the extinction itself. We're only really seeing before and after that interval of extinction. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Great. Um, so we have another question for you um, from uh, Matthew Sinisel. Um, so thanks, Josh. Great work and very good presentation. Um, one, can you comment if this work also changes things regarding correlation to the western part of the island? And two, any progress on the cryptic bentonites for correlation or data? Ah, uh, yes. One, I'm laughing because, yes, the bentonites. Uh, we love the bentonites. Um, the background of this is we found a number of putative bentonites on the island. I think we've measured 20, and only one of them has uh, given us reliable zircon ages. Um, so to the first part of the question, yes. Uh, I've talked with Andre de Rocher about this, and part of the reason why we're going back this summer 
is that this the placement of these surfaces within the Ellis Bay Formation is fundamentally changed from Desrochers at all 2010. Um, and so while some surfaces remain the same, we're now working not only with different packages of sediment, um, and I'd be happy to talk about this more during the tea talk. You can pull up some of the diagrams, different sequences, but we're also working with a four systems track framework. And so what we now expect in this framework to find are low stand wedges, perhaps at the western end of the island. So that's sort of going to change how we correlate the eastern and western sections fundamentally compared to the TR cycles that we're using Desrochers at all 2010. And this will give us a higher resolution with which to interpret patterns of fossil occurrences as in this method from Zimt et al. 20, uh, 2021. And the progress in the cryptic benthonites for correlation. Um, certainly there's the potential for correlation with other sections globally, um, right? We have a volcanic ash from Rousseau Macaire. Um, I will try to flip to that slide quickly. We have a volcanic ash from halfway through the Ellis Bay Formation since you copper all 2013 at Rousseau Macaire that yields a mid to late Hernanchian age, which is significant. Um, given that there has been an argument that the lower part of the Ellis Bay Formation is not actually Hernanchian age. Um, but whether or not that's usable for correlation across the island remains to be seen given the limitations of other bentonites on the island, but it might be useful for global correlation. That would be, I'd, I'd be interested in talking about that with, later with you, MTS. Awesome, thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, from uh, Daniel Segerson. Um, so, hello, I have a question. Would you say that your findings with modeling of marine taxa, um, LADs, FADs, and sequence um, stratigraphic architectures have any implications with regards to the long standing debate of macroevolutionary patterns being biased by rock preservation versus a common cause hypothesis? Whether sedimentary record and macroevolution do the same things because they are primarily driven by the same external factor, e.g., static changes. Yeah, this is a wonderful question. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so, what I would say is that the implications are: I feel like with this method, we now have an approach with which we can use to test the common cause hypothesis in a additional line of inquiry in a robust framework that might allow us to sort of detangle the biological and stratigraphic signatures of the fossil record and get at the heart as to whether the common cause is is a pervasive thing throughout the history of life or restricted to certain intervals, say like the sock transgression where you have major flooding of the continents. So I think my answer to that more or less is that I believe that Zintadol could provide us with a framework that we could use to really investigate those hypotheses. And that would be an exciting avenue of research certainly going forward. Great, thank you so much. Um, you have um, a nice positive message in the chat. Um, you have a link. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the wrong screen, thanks. <laughs> um, so we we have come to the end of our, our Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna take back the screen share from you. Um, Okie dokie. So, Hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so thank you very much, um, Joshua, for for a really awesome talk. Um, it was really cool to to hear more about your research. Um, and thank, thank you very you, much, um, to the audience for joining us. Um, please remember to fill out the weekly feedback form. The link will be in the chat very shortly, so that we can learn a bit more about who attended today's seminar, and join us um again on March seventh. Um, at the same time, we will be joined by Richard Buchman. Um. He was at the Universidad de Federal de los Espíritu Santo in Brazil, um, and Richard will present a talk uh, from fossils to pterosaur neck. Um, so, so going into big fossil world. Um, so we we hope to see you next week. Um, or if you're joining us at the tea time, we have this coming up next. Um, so this is just an informal conversation about the talk in a relaxed setting. And our question for the week is: What is your favorite mass extinction and favorite species of brachiopod? Um, but before that, it's time for a quick break. Um, so remember to get up, walk around, have a quick drink of water, come back in two minutes, and if you have paleo pets, bring them to tea time too. See you in a bit.